the Philippines has experienced devastating earthquakes throughout its history. The 1990 Luzon earthquake that killed 1,600 people, the 1976 Moro Gulf earthquake and tsunami that claimed over 8,000 lives, and countless smaller but still destructive events that have shaped the nation's collective memory. But there is a scenario that keeps seismologists and disaster planners awake at night, one that has never happened in modern Philippine history, but that geological evidence says is not only possible, but inevitable. A magnitude 9.0 megaquake, striking one of the major trenches surrounding the archipelago. Before we enter the timeline, you need to understand where a magnitude 9.0 earthquake could come from in the Philippines. The country sits at the intersection of multiple tectonic plates, creating some of the most dangerous subduction zones in the Pacific Ring of Fire. The Philippine Trench, which runs along the eastern side of Mindanao and extends north into the East Luzon Trench, is capable of generating magnitude 8.5 to 9.0 earthquakes. To the west, the Manila Trench, where the Sunda Plate pushes eastward beneath Luzon, sits dangerously close to Metro Manila and could produce a magnitude 8.0 or higher rupture. Between these massive structures lie smaller but still potent systems. The Negros Trench in the Visayas and the Cotabato and Sulu Trenches in Mindanao, the source of the deadly 1976 Moro Gulf tsunami. Any of these zones could rupture in a massive event, but for this scenario, we will focus on a worst-case magnitude 9.0 earthquake originating from the Philippine Trench off the coast of Mindanao, because this is the structure scientists fear the most. A magnitude 9.0 earthquake is not simply a bigger version of the quakes we are used to experiencing. It releases approximately 32 times more energy than a magnitude 8.0 and nearly 1,000 times more energy than a magnitude 7.0. The 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan which was magnitude 9.1, moved the entire island of Honshu eight feet eastward and created a tsunami that killed over 18,000 people. The 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake, also magnitude 9.1, generated a tsunami that killed 230,000 people across 14 countries. These are the kinds of forces we are talking about when we discuss a Philippine megaquake scenario. Now, let us enter the timeline. It is 2.17 in the morning on an ordinary weekday. Most Filipinos are asleep. Security guards are on their night shifts, a few jeepneys and trucks move along major highways, and hospitals are operating with skeleton crews. Deep beneath the Pacific Ocean, 120 kilometers east of Davao City, the Philippine Trench has been silently storing tectonic stress for centuries. At exactly 2.17 Haas, the fault finally breaks. Immediately, the rupture begins deep underwater, approximately 30 kilometers below the seafloor, and starts racing along the trench at nearly 3 kilometers per second. Within the first 10 seconds, a 400-kilometer section of the fault has slipped, displacing billions of tons of water above it. The 5 Volks seismic network detects the first P waves immediately, but before any automated alert can be processed and transmitted, the much more destructive S-waves and surface waves are already spreading outward. In Davao City, people sleeping in high-rise condos and houses near the coast are violently thrown from their beds as the ground begins shaking with intensity. Nine on the 5 volt scale, the highest possible level. The shaking is so strong that it is impossible to stand or even crawl. Furniture flies across rooms, walls crack and crumble, and glass shatters everywhere. The shaking continues relentlessly across Mindanao. In Davao, Cagayan de Oro, General Santos and Butuan, older concrete buildings and houses built without proper seismic reinforcement begin to collapse. Modern structures designed to withstand magnitude, seven or eight quakes, are pushed beyond their design limits. Some hold, but many sustain severe structural damage. Power lines snap as transformers explode, plunging entire cities into darkness. The shaking is felt intensely across the entire Visayas region, where Cebu City experiences intensity 7 to 8 shaking. Bridges connecting islands begin to crack, and coastal highways buckle. Even in Metro Manila, 800 kilometers from the epicenter, the ground shakes with intensity 5 to 6, strong enough to wake everyone and cause panic, especially in older buildings in Binondo, Quiapo, and Tondo. Gas lines have ruptured throughout Davao and other cities, and electrical shorts are igniting fires in dozens of locations simultaneously. 
Emergency services try to respond, but roads are blocked by collapsed buildings, overturned vehicles, and downed power lines. Cell phone networks are overloaded or completely down as everyone tries to call family members at once. In coastal areas, survivors who make it outside notice something terrifying. The ocean is rapidly receding, exposing the seafloor for hundreds of meters. This is the first sign of the tsunami. FIVOLKS and international tsunami warning centers issue urgent alerts, but communication infrastructure is severely damaged. Sirens blare in some coastal communities, but in many areas, especially rural barangays, people have no warning system at all. The tsunami, traveling at 700 kilometers per hour in the deep ocean, has now slowed as it approaches the shallow coastal waters of Mindanao, but its height is increasing dramatically. The first wave, reaching 8 to 12 meters in height, slams into the eastern coasts of Davao Oriental, Surigao del Sur, and Agusan del Norte. Entire coastal barangays are swept away in seconds. Fishing boats, houses, vehicles, and debris are carried inland up to two kilometers in low-lying areas. In Davao City's coastal districts, the wave crashes through Panacan, Sasa, and the port area flooding streets and trapping thousands of people who did not or could not evacuate in time. Next. The tsunami is now spreading in all directions across the Philippine archipelago. The eastern coasts of Samar and Leyte are hit by waves 6 to 10 meters high, inundating Tacloban City, which is still rebuilding from Super Typhoon Yolanda in 2013. The waves reach the Visayas, smashing into Bohol, Cebu and Negros, overwhelming seawalls and flooding coastal highways in Metro Manila, even though the city is on the opposite side of the country. The shaking has caused widespread panic and some structural damage, especially to older buildings and informal settlements built on reclaimed land or soft soil near Manila Bay. Fires are starting in Divisoria and parts of Quezon City due to gas leaks and electrical faults. The West Valley Fault has not ruptured, but the intense shaking from the distant megaquake has triggered landslides in mountainous areas of Rizal and Bulacan. Minute 15 to minute 20. Back in Mindanao, the second and third tsunami waves arrive, often taller and more destructive than the first. Survivors who went back to search for family members or belongings are caught by surprise and swept away. Hospitals in Davao and Cagayan de Oro, medical supplies are running low and backup generators are failing in some facilities. Philippine National Police and Armed Forces units are mobilizing, but roads are impassable in many areas, and bridges have collapsed, cutting off entire provinces. International tsunami warnings have now been issued for the entire Western Pacific, and countries as far away as Japan, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea are monitoring wave heights as the tsunami radiates outward across the ocean. The scale of the disaster is becoming clear to national authorities in Manila. Initial estimates suggest that tens of thousands of people may already be dead or missing in Mindanao alone, with hundreds of thousands injured and millions displaced. The president convenes an emergency meeting of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, declaring a state of calamity across the entire country. International aid organizations and foreign governments begin offering assistance, but it will take hours or days for significant help to arrive. In the meantime, local responders and ordinary citizens are the only ones who can help. In Davao, volunteers are already forming human chains to pull survivors from collapsed buildings, even as aftershocks continue to shake the ground every few minutes, exactly 30 minutes after the initial rupture. The immediate tsunami threat begins to recede, but the disaster is far from over. Coastal areas across Mindanao, Visayas, and even parts of Palawan are flooded, littered with debris, and cut off from communication and supplies. Fires are burning out of control in multiple cities because water mains are broken and fire trucks cannot navigate blocked streets. Hospitals are running out of space, placing injured people in hallways, parking lots, and even on sidewalks. Thousands of aftershocks, many of them magnitude 6.0 or higher, will continue for days and weeks collapsing buildings that were already weakened and preventing rescue operations from proceeding safely. The death toll, which may already be in the tens of thousands, will continue to climb as search and rescue teams reach more remote areas and as injured people succumb to their wounds in areas where medical care is unavailable. 
This is not science fiction. It is based on real scientific understanding of how subduction zone megaquakes behave and what the Philippine Trench is capable of producing. Geological records show that this trench has generated magnitude 8 plus earthquakes in the past, and scientists warn that a magnitude 9.0 event, while rare, is within the realm of possibility, especially given the ongoing seismic unrest that shook the Philippines in late 2025. Between September 30th and mid-October 2025, the country experienced a frightening sequence. A magnitude 6.9 earthquake near Cebu, followed by a magnitude 7.6 quake off Mindanao that triggered tsunami warnings and dozens of magnitude 5-plus aftershocks across the archipelago. Five Volks described it as regional stress redistribution, meaning that multiple fault systems were shifting under immense pressure a pattern that could be a precursor to something much larger. The question every Filipino must ask is not whether a megaquake is possible, but whether we are prepared for it when it comes. Japan, which experienced a magnitude 9.1 earthquake in 2011, has spent decades building strict construction codes, tsunami walls, early warning systems and public education programs, yet still suffered catastrophic losses. The Philippines has made progress through collaborations with JICA and Fivolks, expanding seismic and GPS monitoring networks and improving tsunami readiness through coastal drills and warning systems. But challenges remain. Rural areas still lack reinforced infrastructure. Aging buildings in cities like Manila and Cebu would struggle to withstand a major event. And public awareness of tsunami evacuation routes is still inconsistent. What we just walked through represent the immediate crisis. But the true impact of a magnitude 9.0 megaquake would unfold over weeks, months, and years. Infrastructure damage could exceed 1 trillion pesos. Millions of people would be displaced, requiring long-term shelter and support. Supply chains for food, water, fuel, and medicine would be disrupted across the entire country. The psychological trauma on survivors, especially children, would last for generations. And because the Philippines is an archipelago, the logistical challenge of delivering aid to isolated islands with destroyed ports and airports would be immense, far more difficult than disaster response in a country with intact land borders. So what can you do right now, today, to prepare for this scenario? First, know your risk. Check if you live in a coastal area that could be hit by a tsunami within minutes of a major offshore quake. Learn your evacuation routes to higher ground and practice them with your family. Second, strengthen your home if possible, securing heavy furniture and appliances that could fall and cause injury during shaking. Third, prepare an emergency kit with water, food, flashlight, battery-operated radio, first aid supplies, and copies of important documents, and keep it in an accessible location. Fourth, Participate in earthquake and tsunami drills organized by your barangay or city government. These drills are based on real scenarios and can save your life. And fifth, spread this knowledge to your family, neighbors, and community, because survival in a megaquake scenario depends not just on government response, but on ordinary people knowing what to do in those critical first minutes. The first 30 minutes after a magnitude 9.0 megaquake would be the most chaotic, terrifying, and deadly period. But they would also be the time when individual preparedness and quick thinking matter most. The ground will shake, the tsunami will come, and infrastructure will fail. But if enough Filipinos understand the threat and know how to respond, thousands or even tens of thousands of lives can be saved. If this video helped you see the reality of what a Philippine megaquake could look like, like, subscribe, and share it widely so more people can prepare. And watch the other videos on this channel that break down the specific faults and trenches threatening different parts of the country, because understanding where the danger comes from is the first step in protecting yourself and the people you love.